You see how the grid snaps behind the 3D shape? Well, that annoyed me so much, I thought to myself, man, I could code this in a weekend. And this is how my eight month long weekend project began. So I decided that I would create a video editor that does everything Manum does, but in real time. And I would also fix that bug I ran into. How do you create a video editor that can animate anything? The first step is coming up with a technique to render any sort of animation in an arbitrary length of time. Kind of like how this clip where I draw in the rocket ship can run in any length of time. The write-in animation was probably the most important animation to me. This was one of the biggest reasons I chose to use Manum, because who doesn't like those awesome write-in animations? I figured, if I can get the write-in animation working, then I can do anything. How does it work then? Well, the write-in animation starts with some text. Text is really just a collection of Bezier curves, which I cover in detail in this video. Bezier curves also happen to have an interesting property, which is if you plug in a T value between 0 and 1, you can draw a partial Bezier curve. This is great for one curve, but remember, one character is a collection of several curves, and a word is a collection of several characters. So we need a way to normalize these collections into one big discrete range from 0 to 1. We'll start with a character. The question we want to answer is, given a t-value of something like 0.5, how much of the character do we draw? And the answer is surprisingly simple. Let's think of a collection of Bezier curves as a path, which is the typical nomenclature for this concept. If you're walking on a path and I asked you to walk to 50% of the path, you would easily be able to do that. Even though the path may have several winding curves, you know how to find the 50% marker. You just take how long the total path is, let's say it's two miles, and walk half of that distance. So the 50% marker would be at one mile. This is exactly what I did to write in the characters. If I think about the collection of Bezier curves as one big path, then I can calculate the approximate total length of the character. Then when I'm asked to draw 50% of the character, I can draw in each curve, see how far I've walked along the path, and if the 50% mark is in the middle of a curve, then I can just split that specific curve at the right place, and now I've drawn 50% of the character. Now let's extend this. We want to draw 50% of the entire phrase. Let's say we're writing in the phrase, hello world. Well, how do we draw 50% of the phrase? Let's just draw half of the characters. This phrase is nine characters, so we can draw 4.5 characters, and we've now done the same thing. Now that I had reverse engineered the write-in animation, the next step was to create a GUI that I could use to put together different animations. Any good video editor needs a timeline so that you can jump around to different points in your scene, and that's what I decided to make first. I used DRIM GUI to get the basic GUI components up and running. Then I made a custom GUI component that took a collection of segments, which represent the different clips on the timeline, and a cursor position, which represents where on the timeline the cursor is. Then I used that information to render the list of segments and the cursor. It was a lot of code, but there wasn't anything too interesting about this logic. Another important feature I wanted to work on was morphing animations. Morphing animations are essentially when you want to morph one object composed of several paths into another object composed of several paths. This is fairly simple, assuming that each object has the same number of paths. Each shape in the editor is really just a collection of Bezier curves, including lines in Bezier form. The nice thing about Bezier curves is if you have a lower order Bezier curve, it's trivial to upgrade that to a higher form. This means that you can morph something like a line into a cubic Bezier curve without distorting the shape. How do you actually morph the curves though? Well, a Bezier curve consists of a start point, an end point, and zero or more control points. If we want to morph from one Bezier curve into another Bezier curve, all you have to do is interpolate the start points, the end points, and all the control points. If we interpolate these between 0 and 1, then we end up changing the shape of the object smoothly over time. And if you remember from earlier, we already have all of our animations based around this 0 to 1 time range, so it's fairly easy to use these t values to actually morph the objects. Once you combine all these concepts, you get this cool interpolation, with one caveat. As long as each object has the same number of curves, this is easy. 
Once the two objects have a different number of curves, this gets really, really hard. Essentially, if they're composed of differing number of curves, you need to split the smaller object up into a larger number of curves until it equals the same number as the larger object. This gets even more complicated because you want to make sure these splits are spaced somewhat equidistantly, otherwise the animation will look very strange. I delved into several different techniques while doing this and ended up settling on a math trick that would just evenly distribute the number of splits along each curve. Maybe I'll go into greater depth in another video about this technique, but for now, we'll move on. I continued adding several other features, and around this time I saw a video by Arth Official showcasing his animation creation tool. His tool supports audio waveform previews, and I thought that would be a neat addition. I decided to see if I could add one to my editor, and it was surprisingly easy. Audio waveforms are very simple. They're just a collection of samples of audio over a discrete time period. If we use WAV files, then we can simplify our lives since a WAV file is uncompressed and represents the waveform exactly. For example, if you create a C structure that looks like this, then you can literally just read a WAV file into this structure and you have your waveform. To display this waveform, we can use all the different pieces of data here to draw a graph that represents discrete time steps on our timeline. The sample rate tells us how many samples are taken per second. So a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz means that we have 44,100 samples of data for every one second of audio. We can use this information to literally loop through our audio data 44,100 times for every second of data. Then, if we want five pixel line segments, we can subdivide the data into groups that represent five pixels on the timeline. Then average the samples that occur over five pixels, and we have the height for our audio waveform at that position. The other fields in here tell me how to read the data appropriately and whether it's dual or mono audio, but those aren't significant to the rendering of the audio waveform. With this done, I now have a way to display audio waveforms that you can import into your project. I could also play the audio using the OpenAL library, and this feature could be considered complete for now. Now we get to the real crux of the problem. The main reason I wanted to move away from Manum was because of this one animation. This bug was driving me insane. Manum doesn't fully support 3D rendering because, as far as I can tell, it doesn't actually use a depth buffer. The depth buffer is important because it determines which pixels are in front so that you can appropriately blend the pixel with pixels behind it, or so that you can discard the pixels behind it if they aren't visible. Since I'm using OpenGL, I've literally built my entire application around this concept, so adding 3D support was relatively easy. The only hard parts to code were 3D lines, which are surprisingly difficult to draw, and blending. I solved drawing 3D lines with the help of this article, and I'll leave it linked in the description if you're curious about how that works. For the blending, I used the same technique that I used in my Minecraft clone, which is order independent transparency. There's a great article you can find here accompanied by a research paper that goes into more depth about the techniques used. It results in a fairly simple technique that gives you accurate blending on a pixel level, and you don't even have to sort the pixels or objects, which is the biggest optimization. Another feature that Manum had that I wanted was LaTeX support. This is useful for when you're trying to create mathematical equations, because typesetting equations is insanely difficult. My first thought was I would typeset these equations myself. Then, I took a look at the documentation for math tables in a true type font. I immediately rejected this idea. My next thought was to use a library to embed the LaTeX typesetting code directly into my code. Well, it turns out that LaTeX is based off of Tech, which was written by Donald Knuth in the early 80s. Donald Knuth wrote Tech in a language that's used by virtually nobody today. Then he rewrote it in Pascal, which is also used by very few people today. Anyways, I searched for a long time and was not able to find any easily interoperable library of LaTeX that worked with C++. If you know of any C++ libraries for LaTeX, please let me know. So I moved on to my last resort. I said, screw it, I'm going to see what Manum does. Well, it looks like the Manum devs must have also said, screw it, I'm just going to launch the LaTeX process on the user's machine and generate an SVG. <laughs> so I decided to do the same thing. If the user has LaTeX installed on their machine, I just launch it and transform the LaTeX into an SVG, then use that to generate the paths. But this brings in another problem. I had to write an SVG parser that transformed the SVG files into the paths that my program actually used. 
EQ a lot of pain and headaches later, and now I have a semi-usable SVG parser. I'll describe some of these challenges in a few minutes. At this point, I really wanted to be able to navigate around my scene and move objects in a more friendly manner, so I yoinked some code from old projects and threw together a simple editor camera. This camera allows the user to click and drag around the viewport and zoom in and out. I also added mouse picking code so that you can click objects and have them become the active object, which allows you to drag them around the scene using some gizmos. I also wanted a viewport that showed you what the final rendered scene would look like, so I added multi-viewport support. This was pretty easy because I coded this engine around the idea that you may want to re-render the scene from different cameras. I refactored the code a bit and abstracted the scene rendering so you could just give it a frame buffer and a camera, and now I could render to multiple viewports. The gizmos were also fairly simple code that was just tedious to write. I coded this in a Dear I Am GUI style where you can create multiple gizmos and check if they're being modified in an immediate mode style. Now that I was capable of creating fairly complex scenes, the performance was really starting to matter. The library I was using for vector graphic rendering was supposed to run really good on the GPU. Spoiler, it didn't. I looked it up and other people ran into the same performance issue and the author's suggestion was to cache the SVGs into an intermediate buffer and then render the SVGs as quads. This sounds reasonable, right? Wrong. This was a problem for two reasons. One, I had no way to calculate the bounding box of a path. And two, my paths were animatable, which meant I needed to be able to re-render an SVG every frame. My solution was twofold. First, I calculated the bounding boxes of the paths. That one was pretty straightforward. Second, I created a cache that would render the SVG to a square in the texture, then reuse those texture coordinates in the future. If it's past an SVG that isn't in the texture already, it evicts the oldest cached SVG that's big enough to fit this new one, then it draws the new SVG over the old one spot. This is called an LRU cache, or least recently used cache. This still doesn't solve my problem of animating SVGs though. Well, I realized that I only animate the SVGs while drawing in the path and while morphing SVGs. So if I can solve those two problems, then I've essentially solved this problem entirely. Drawing in the SVG path is something that I've experimented with before without using vector graphics libraries. The best solution I came up with was to tessellate the path that's being drawn. This means converting the lines into a collection of triangles that I can send to the GPU. The GPU is really good at drawing triangles, but it really sucks at drawing vector graphics. Turning lines into triangles is a bit more difficult than you would think. I essentially have to figure out how curvy a Bezier curve is and use that to determine how many segments to break it up into. Then I break it up into several quads where each quad is projected out from the center of the curve by the stroke width. This projection follows the normal of the curve, which we can get using the derivative of the Bezier curve at that point. Then I can go through and draw each segment. This is great for drawing individual curves, but combining the curves together into one path is a whole nother problem. You see, in order to create one cohesive path, I need to join the curves where they meet. This involves creating something called a miter join, which is where you figure out the direction the curves are intersecting at, then you find the angle between them that joins them together evenly, then you project it outwards while maintaining the same stroke width for the incoming curve and the outgoing curve, and you finally have your join. But wait, there's more. This would be way too simple. So sometimes when you calculate this projection, it can go horribly wrong because the only way to resolve the join with a miter would involve projecting the join infinitely. This is because the math degenerates in cases where joins are too sharp of an angle. So the SVG spec has a way to handle this, which is called a bevel. So if the math degenerates, I have to catch that and then calculate a different join called a bevel where it basically chops off the infinite edge while maintaining the same stroke width for the ingoing curve and the outgoing curve. And finally, finally, you have your tessellated curve. Anyways, that sped things up considerably, and I still haven't solved the second problem yet, so we'll ignore that. Moving on. I said we would come back to SVGs, right? Well, I figured since I already had SVG support for LaTeX, how hard could it be to add in general SVG support? Ha! Never ask yourself that question, how hard could it be? For the most part, I could reuse the code I already had and it just kind of worked for general SVGs. but. Then I realized certain SVGs weren't displaying correctly. Well, it turns out that SVGs can be filled in one of two ways. You can fill an SVG using the even odd rule, which basically says if you cast a ray from a pixel and hit an even number of curves, this pixel is solid, otherwise it's transparent. 
Or you could use the non-zero fill rule, which says if you cast a ray from this pixel and hit a winding curve, add one, otherwise subtract one. If the result is non-zero, the pixel is solid, otherwise it's transparent. The details here are unnecessary. What is important about this is it changed the way the SVGs looked in my program because I always used the even odd fill rule. So to change this, I just had to get the information about how the curve is filled from the SVG file. Easy enough, right? I was already using TinyXML2 to parse the SVG file, so I figured I could just parse the property that told me what kind of fill rule to use. Simple, right? Wrong. <laughs> it turns out SVGs can embed CSS. That's right, the SVG file can embed a whole nother markup language which I now need to parse to get my information. So I sat down for five hours and coded the crappiest CSS parser you've ever seen, but you know what? It works, and I'm so happy that I'm done with parsing. Now that I could draw some awesome SVGs, I wanted to add scripting. So I embedded Luau, which is a derivative of Lua with some safety and optimization features added on for good measure. I went ahead and hooked up my C++ code to Luau and created a way to call a function in your Luau code that you could use to generate objects. Now you can write scripts to generate more complex objects. I plan on adding scriptable animations as well so you can modify existing objects while they're being animated, but that's yet to be done. And finally, because apparently I'm a masochist, and I decided I didn't have enough parsing already, I thought it would be great if you could have a code syntax highlighter. But not just a code highlighter for one programming language, I want to support them all. Well, how do you write a piece of code that can parse any piece of code in any language and color it with some syntax colors according to some theme? The answer is a metric crap ton of regexes. I sat down for 12 hours and coded a parser for the TextMate grammar files, which VS Code uses to do their syntax highlighting, and a parser for VS Code themes. Now you can import any programming language grammar from a VS Code grammar file, which is based off TextMate grammars, and any theme which defines the syntax coloring, and you can highlight all the code. This uses a library that I can't pronounce to perform the regex searches, but we'll call it the O library. I used the O library to execute some regexes to split the code up into a bunch of matches. Then I used some CSS selectors to figure out which theme rule to apply to that match. It doesn't really resolve CSS selectors correctly, but it looks close enough for me. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed my brief description of how my weekend project turned into an 8 month long descent into madness. I have to fix a lot of bugs in this program, and then I have to add a few more features, but I'm hoping that I'll get this program to a stable release so that I can use it to make more videos. By the way, all the animations in this video, including the one you're watching right now, were created using this program. Once I get it to a stable release, I'll create a public release that you can play around with. The code is open source though, so if you want to try to compile the behemoth yourself, go ahead. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, if you do, you know what to do. Here are some interesting bugs that happened while I was coding this monstrosity, and until next time, thanks for watching.